Tonight I want to uh, journey with you. I want to explore our subject in almost unbelievable report. And the language here is from Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? And it proceeds to discuss Messiah and the suffering of Messiah. Tonight I want to explore the significance of this central tenet of the Christian message. Tonight I want to journey from a garden to a hill, yeah? Tonight I want to go from a garden to, to Golgotha. Every major religion has a symbol that is generally recognized to represent it. Like in Buddhism, the lotus flower would represent uh, enlightenment or peace. For example, in, in, in Islam, we have the crescent moon and the, and the star representing the five pillars. In Judaism, we have the star of David. Religions have symbols that capture something about its essence. But when you get to Christianity, you take a dramatic turn, and we have a cross. And tonight I want to invite you to step back from your over-familiarity and just, just look at this with fresh eyes. Why would the early Christians settle on the universal symbol for their religion on an instrument of torture? Why would they select an instrument of execution? as the symbol that embodies the essence of that religion? Is that a good question? Our over-familiarity has taken us so far back that we have lost a sense of the irony of that. In fact, in the original context of early Christianity, this idea of a cross representing your movement and your religion was offensive. It was scandalous. Because it went against everything that was common about people's idea of God. It it ran counter to Roman ideas. It ran counter to Jewish ideas. This was a radical thing. To raise a cross to represent your movement. And in the early church, the ancient records reveal that the early Christians were ridiculed for this very thing. For example, Justin Martyr, who was one of the early Christian apologists, this is what he says in in, in recording sort sort of the spirit of the age, what was in the air at the time. They say that our madness consists in the fact that we put a crucified man in second place after the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of the world. Our madness. Another document, and around the year 109, in the 190, says this. This is capturing sort of the opinion of the time. A senseless and crazy superstition. Now think about that. The popular opinion of the time is that your religion is a senseless and crazy superstition. To say that their ceremonies center on a man put to death for his crime and on the fatal wood of the cross is to assign to these abandoned wretches sanctuaries which are appropriate to them in the kind of worship that they deserve. Now, in, in light of this, in light of the mood of the time, Early Christians insisted that the cross was the central symbol that really captured the essence of their religion. It seems contradictory. It seems strange. It seems like not the best choice, right? I mean, maybe, maybe that little fish that we put in our, in our bumper stickers would have been a, a little bit of a softer move, right? No. We want a cross. We want an instrument of torture and execution. It sounds crazy really does. Why? They captured something that I'll refer to as, and others have referred to as, the terrible beauty of the cross. This is contradiction. There's this tension. The terrible 
beauty of the cross. This idea of a crucified God was a death blow to Aristotle's God. Aristotle's concept of the divine. The idea that God is impassable is the word. Meaning God doesn't change. God is unmovable. God is emotionless. God is unaffected by humans. And here's the biggie for tonight. God does not suffer. And so when the early Christians walked around preaching this message that not only did they they raise a cross, but they attached to that cross the idea that God is love, they were dismantling an entire system of what God was like. Now follow this. This was the idea. If God cannot suffer, if God is incapable of suffering, then God is incapable of love. Now sit on that for a second. The idea of love is that it is inevitably vulnerable to pain and suffering. Do do, do you need to be convinced of that? Anybody who is engaged in any kind of human relationship right now, do you need to be convinced of that, right? Love by its very nature is vulnerable to pain and suffering, obviously in varying degrees. And obviously the pain and suffering is well worth it, amen? But love by definition is vulnerable to suffering. Now think about what that does to the Christian concept of God. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the man who was executed by the Nazis, uh, he wrote this. He said, only the suffering God can help. So in Scripture, this is the picture, this is the portrait that is hung on the wall of all these prophetic writings. The language is very emotional. The language is very evocative. It's very, it's very painful. For example, Isaiah 53. Listen to the language. He, Messiah, he, God, was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of, what everybody? Suffering and familiar with pain. There's no getting around it. That the God of Scripture is vulnerable to suffering and to pain. Now, here's the interesting thing about this passage. What is the cause of God's suffering and pain? Human beings. Human beings. This may seem simplistic, but I assure you, it is not. In Isaiah chapter 63, as the story, the long story of God's people and God's dealing with the ancient people is rehearsed. We get this, in all of their affliction, he himself was afflicted. How's that for a beautiful passage? In other words, that the experiences that human beings are going through on earth are directly reflected in how God is feeling. How was God's day today? I once read a poem called, God Cried Himself to Sleep Last Night. Right? There's no way for God to untether himself from what's happening on earth and the effect that that has on him. It's really, it's really incredible. In Jeremiah 31, through the symbol of Ephraim and, and God's people, God is speaking about his, the aching in his heart. And he says, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? By the way, the answer is no. For though I spoke against him, right, though all these judgments and and, and threatenings of God to the people of Israel. Though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. It's powerful because that phrase, my heart yearns, that could be translated in different ways. And some translators say, my heart breaks for him. The picture is really, really compelling. It's really beautiful. And John Stott has this line, this one-liner. And he says this, if I can get it. Oh. In the real world of pain, 
How could one worship a God that was immune to it? Powerful. So we ask, this is the backdrop for understanding what is happening when Jesus is pictured in this mysterious garden. This is the backdrop for, for understanding what is happening when Jesus takes the road from Gethsemane to Golgotha. This is the backdrop. This is what's happening behind the scenes, right? Now, to sum up a very, a very long uh, explanation, this is the way I have basically captured God's situation and the pain that God has and the story of the gospel and why Calvary is necessary and what Calvary accomplishes. And it goes a little bit something like this. Can you read this with me? That which God hates the most is inside that which he loves the most. Does that sound like a problem to you? <laughs> now, let's, now let's pump it up a notch. That which, can you help me out? And that which God loves the most is in love with that which he hates the most. And we introduce you to the pain of God. All right. So the story of the gospel is how does God separate the object of his love from the object of his hatred. Right? And it requires a very careful surgery, right? The principle of the Old Testament sanctuary and these rituals that would take place in the Old Testament, the whole point of it, they were acting out something that would help them in a tangible way feel the reality of what God is feeling with this thing called sin, right? And by acting it out, the idea was it was supposed to um, ruin their relationship with sin, right? The little lamb and the suffering of the lamb was supposed to ruin their, their infatuation with sin and with selfishness by having a tangible reference point to know what is happening here. What is the spiritual reality happening here? So in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters into the picture, and immediately we are told that Adam and Eve are trying to hide from God. You remember that? It says that they went hiding from him. And where did they go hide from him? What does it say? Do you remember? They went and hid behind some bushes. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Is it possible to hide from God behind some bushes? <laughs> now, let me ask you a follow-up. Do you think Adam and Eve knew that? <laughs> the minute sin enters into the race, it stupefies people. The, the minute sin enters into the race, it introduces guilt so deep that all we want is to be as far away as possible from the very source of our love, right? Right? So why does God hate, oh, no, no let, me, let me back up. Let me catch you with this. Did you know that there is hatred in the heart of God? Right? It, it's, it's, it's in Genesis, right? And did you know that God's hate, actually, you remember Hebrews? In Hebrews chapter 1, we are told that God loves righteousness and he hates sin. So check this out. God's love for righteousness is proportionate to his hatred for sin. Right? I need this all as backdrop before we get to this garden. Right? This is the situation that's happening. This is the report that is unbelievable. When we get to Gethsemane, what I'll do now, I'll proceed. And by the way, this is Friday night. Right? We're dealing with Friday night tonight. And when Ty follows up with me, he's going to take you to Sunday morning. Can you say amen? amen? But we're dealing with Friday night, and I'm setting the table for Ty. When we get to the garden, oh, man, what a sacred scene. Would you, would you, would you just enter this with me? We get to the garden, and, and the Bible paints this sacred scene, this incredible scene. And before Jesus is, uh, is even at the garden, as he is contemplating what awaits him, Jesus is already showing signs 
of distress. Jesus is already showing signs of panic, and I'm going to be using words tonight that just feel wrong in relation to God. You with me? Jesus is showing signs of panic already. Why? Because on his mind is the ordeal that awaits him. In, if you're taking notes, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 50, in John chapter 12 and verse 27, we read that Jesus is distressed. And the word there really means he is tormented. We read that Jesus is troubled. And the word there really is he is agitated to the core. It's stunning in anticipation of Gethsemane. And when he gets to Gethsemane, we're painted this picture in the gospel record. And B.B. Warfield, who's a, who was a theologian at Princeton Seminary, conducted a word study of the words that are used in the gospels to describe the disposition, the mental reality, and the emotional reality of Jesus in the garden. And this is what he came up with. When Luke uses the word agonia, it means consternation. Just, just, just dwell with me on a word study. Paint the picture in your mind. Consternation. Matthew's idea of troubled, it means a loathing aversion. Jesus himself describes his own experience as being overwhelmed with sorrow. And that idea expresses a mental pain, a distress, which hems him in on every side. And Mark's word for deeply distressed can be rendered horror struck. That's an intense scene, isn't it? Why the intensity? Well, if the backdrop is that God here is, is dealing with he is dealing with the sins of the world. And when we are pictured with Jesus in Gethsemane, we're taken to him like he's on his knees and he has a mysterious cup on his hand. You remember that? And he's praying to his father and he's, he's praying whether or not he can take this cup and it's trembling in his hand. And what's in the cup? What is it that Jesus is about to, to, to basically take in in full? it's trembling in his hands. And be, the reason it's trembling in his hands is because it is the embodiment of the sins of the world. Now process this. The sins that have been committed, the sins that are committed, and the sins that will be committed. How many of you have been in a state of absolute guilt and shame to the point where you don't even feel like you can pray to God? Or am I the only one on stage? How many of you have been there? Now imagine that mental agony in one moment over one specific stage in your life and now lump onto that every single situation, every single guilt, every single burden of the sins of the world and you are going to take it in in one, in one shot. So it's trembling in his hands. And it's so intense that the Bible tells us that as he was in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus is not afraid of physical suffering. Jesus is not in this garden terrified about the powers of darkness, terrified about what the devil will do to him. Jesus is not shri shrinking back from physical suffering. Jesus is dealing with something here that is identified with God's judgment on sin. And Jesus is slowly, he's, he's feeling it. it. The process has begun. And he is slowly becoming identified with the very sin that his soul recoils from. So he hangs back in horror. And some of the language, some of the language is it's pretty intense. In the book, Desire of Ages, that author basically paints the picture that as Jesus realizes the guilt of the sins of the world, it is as if a cloud goes over him 
and blots out the face of his father. This is what causes Jesus to be horror struck in the situation. So Jesus is in the garden and he gets interrupted, the story goes. And he's about to be betrayed. And he's taken in, he's arrested, and then they take him into the praetorium. And the praetorium is the headquarters of the governor. And, and this is hard reading. I don't know how, how long it's been since you've read this, but it's hard reading. Because when Matthew records Jesus in the praetorium, he tells us that the soldiers, that the soldiers had fun with him. That the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the, into the governor's palace, into the headquarters, and they gathered the whole garrison of soldiers around him, and they had fun with him. The text tells us, and if you read Matthew's account, Mark's account, and Luke's account, and you, and you stitch it together, it is difficult reading. And I want to take you through that difficulty now. I want you to take your mind there. Now imagine these soldiers surrounding Jesus, and they're taking turns mocking him. First, they put a purple robe over him. And they put a purple robe over him because now they're, they're teasing him as a king, right? Then they put the crown of thorns on him. And then the Bible says they spit in his face, and then they begin to slap him in his face. And then we're told that he is hit over the head. Then we're told that as, G as they're taking turns on Jesus, I want you to picture this scene that is presented in the Gospels that they are now bowing down and worship him. In fact, this is not the first time Jesus in this process goes through this because just moments before, we're told that he's surrounded and they are blindfolding him. And as they hit him, they're saying, guess who hit you? And they're mocking him to predict who was the one that hit him. When the biblical writers record this, they are wanting the reader to feel really uncomfortable. Let me ask you a question. What's it like to be one of those soldiers there? Now, fast forward. Okay, just pause for a second and fast forward. The events already take place. It's a week later. What's it like to wake up? You're one of those Roman soldiers and to realize after the report has gone out, it's past Sunday, and you realize now that that person was actually God in the flesh. What's it like being that Roman guard that, that remembers him walking up to God in the flesh and tsk, spitting in his face and slapping him in his face? Now, can you understand now, through this whole thing, why this message being preached in the Greco-Roman world would have sounded absolutely crazy? That God himself, the ruler of the universe, would subject himself to this type of of treatment, and that a movement would be launched to worship that God as God of the universe. It sounds absolutely nuts. Now, the story presents different uh, participants. There are different protagonists on Jesus' road to Golgotha. And I want, to, I want to take you through some of that now because it's not just the soldiers. It's very easy to demonize the soldiers. But if you zoom the camera back, there are other protagonists in this story. And when Jesus was born, if you remember, I'll give you this text if you're taking notes. Write down Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. And in that passage, we're told basically at Jesus' birth that throughout the course of his life, he is going, his life and the reactions that he will elicit, right, will reveal the hearts of mankind. So I want to I take you through a brief portrait, a, a brief survey of the portraits of the human heart. Because the way that people react to Jesus on this journey reveals to us the various ways of the human heart, the motivations of the human heart. For example, we have... Judas, we have the Sanhedrin, which is the religious establishment, and we have Pilate, the political representative. Now, Judas, 
it's very easy to demonize. It's very easy to see Judas as just out for no good from the beginning. It's easy to demonize him as a greedy person who just wanted to get rich. But I believe it's far more complicated than that. And frankly, it's easy for the reader to demonize the protagonist because the more you demonize them, the more distance you create between them and you. While acting on his greed, Judas' betrayal was motivated by frustration. Frustration that Jesus refused to fit into Judas' own idea, his plans, and his expectations for what Messiah would be like. In fact, Judas really didn't mean to betray Jesus to death. Judas assumed that all he was doing was pressing fast forward and putting Jesus in a pickle so that Jesus would finally stand up and fight to defend himself and in the process, finally assume his throne as the king of the Jews and crush the Romans. So think about this. If we were to, if we were to analyze this as a portrait of the motivations of the human heart that, that Jesus' final scenes put a magnifying glass over, we see here that Jesus was crucified because of the natural inclination of the human heart to want God to fit into our own picture of what God should be like. It's easy to say, Judas was greedy, wanted to be rich. Oh, that's, what an evil person. I surely don't struggle with that, right? But the portraits that are presented are way more subtle than that, right? Right? Way more subtle than that, and it closes the gap between the reader and the protagonist. We have the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the religious establishment, and Jesus consistently challenged the religious establishment for caring more about regulations than people, caring more about ceremonies and laws than love. So the clash between Jesus and the religious authorities was one, Over authority, it was a power struggle. This is John Stott, which we'll we'll be coming back to. He says this, the religious leaders were proud, racially, nationally, religiously, and morally. They were proud of their nation's long history of a special relation with God, proud of their leadership role in this nation, and above all, proud of their authority. Their contest with Jesus, contest with Jesus was essentially an authority struggle. Then we have Pilate, poor Pilate. Pilate's in a pickle, and he tries three times to pass the buck. He's like, I don't see, him. I don't see any guilt in this man. And they're crying for blood, and he's, try- he's fumbling, trying to find a way out without taking a stand. He's trying to pass the buck, and he does it three times. Pilate was concerned about his reputation, How's that? Pilate was concerned what others thought of him. He gave in to the pressure and surrendered, as as we're told, surrendered Jesus to their will because he wanted to satisfy the crowd. His conscience was drowned by the loud voices. Now, here's what I find pretty interesting, if you want to write this down. In each one of these cases... Judas, the Sanhedrin, and Pilate, the same phrase is used, to hand over. Now follow this for a second. Judas handed him over to the religious leaders. Put that, put that in, your, in your mind. The religious leaders handed him over to Pilate. Pilate handed him over to the soldiers. It's interesting that Jesus passes through many hands, and it's hard to keep track of, and the writers are purposely making it difficult to keep track of, because the whole point is that the reader is to view himself or herself in the story, right? Jesus passes through many hands. It begins with the church member, right, a disciple. And then he passes through the crowd's hands. Then he passes through the hands of the religious authorities and then the political authorities and then the military 
And it was a coalition between liberals and conservatives that betrayed Jesus. It reminds me of that Negro spiritual, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Right? And the way that that the Gospels are structured in this narrative is to get to the answer to that question. To the answer that says, yes, we were there. When Jesus is handed over, he is subjected to possibly one of the most cruel forms of execution ever invented. This is back to John Stott. Crucifixion was a cruel method of execution. It deliberately delayed death until maximum torture had been inflicted. The prisoner would first be publicly humiliated by being stripped naked. He was then laid on his back on the ground while his hands were either nailed or roped to the horizontal wooden beam and his feet to the vertical pole. The cross was then hoisted to an upright position and dropped into a socket. Usually a peg or a seat was provided to take some of the weight off the victim's body to prevent it from being torn loose. But there he would hang helplessly, exposed to intense physical pain, public ridicule, daytime heat, nighttime cold, and the torture would last for how long? For several days. I understand and I am very well aware that this is very grim. And and it's grim on purpose because... Because we're getting to glory. Amen? We're getting to glory. As Jesus is, is, is hanging on the cross, he prays this loud prayer. Father, forgive them. This is Luke 23, 34. For they do not know what they are doing. And one, one poet put it this way. He said, comparing the birth of Jesus and the joy To the death of Jesus in the darkness, he said this, At the birth of the Son of God, there was brightness at midnight. At the death of the Son of God, there was darkness at noon. And then we get to the most incredible statement, arguably the most incredible statement in this entire story. And it's this right here. And about the ninth hour... Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is a passage that for centuries, theologians, philosophers have been trying to wrap their minds around this here. Here is the Son of God crying out to the Father Why have you forsaken me? And it sounds so incredibly wrong. And I love love this from Stanley Harawas. Listen to this. What are we to make of such a cry of this, if this is the Son of God? We cannot suppress the thought. He's, He's saying we can't resist thinking this. If you are the Son of God, should you be saying this? If you are God, if you are the second person of the Trinity, how can you be abandoned? And then there's this, there's this line here. This is clearly a God with a problem. There is ample precedence in the Psalms for expressions of being abandoned by God. There are many verses in the Psalms expressing abandonment from God. But we think the Psalms express our despair, our feeling of abandonment, not God's abandonment. We assume, therefore, that it is not seemly, it is not appropriate for God himself to pray the Psalms. Confronted by these words from the cross, we find it almost impossible for us to resist trying to protect God from being God. Accordingly, we seek some way to explain how or why these words of abandonment could be uttered by Jesus. And there is no other way to explain how these words could be uttered by Jesus other than the fact that our sins blocked out the sunshine of his father's face. And when we record The final scenes in John chapter 19, write this down, 
for our study. John chapter 19, verses 30 to 33. We read that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, and it's Friday night, that the religious leaders wanted to bring them down in order for them not to hang over Sabbath. And so they were instruct, the soldiers were instructed to break the, the knees, the legs of the crucified, the, thief, the two thieves in Christ, and to pull them down from the cross in order to re-put them back up after Sabbath. And the record says that they went up to the first, the first thief and they broke his legs. They went to the second thief and broke his legs. And when they went and approached Jesus, they realized that Jesus was already dead. In other words, John is basically telling us something is awfully wrong here because Jesus died way too early. You follow this? The other two thieves are still alive. Why is Jesus already dead? And what John is trying to communicate here is that Jesus died not of physical torture. That what Jesus is experiencing on the cross is something far more significant, far more profound. Now, here's where the story gets incredible. Because, as I told you, I'm setting the table for, for Sunday morning. As the biblical writers and the Pauline epistles and the New Testament gets written, the way that the church interpreted this story is not, just, just feel how heavy this room is right now. Feel how somber all of this all of these passages, all of this information is. Feel how heavy it is to sit with that, right? You with me? That the early church, as they presented this, they did not view this in, in, this, in this heavy blow. It, this was not the end of the story because when they see Jesus on the cross, they, they, they lift the curtain and they show us something that is absolutely profound. And we need to get there because that's the whole point of me being up here right now. And this is, write this down, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, and this is, this is a powerful and incredible depiction of what was happening on the cross. And it, and it takes us from this moment of somberness and heaviness, and it takes us to the glory and the victory of Jesus Christ. And it says this, Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers... It's into the language here. Having disarmed principalities and powers, we're not simply speaking about earthly powers, worldly powers here. Jesus made a public, what everybody? A public spectacle of them. Other translations say Jesus made a public display of them, triumphing over them, who is them? The principalities and powers, triumphing over them in the cross. Now, this language, you have to follow this. Paul, writing in the Greco-Roman world, is bringing in a Roman picture here. He, this, this concept of, of making your enemies a public spectacle as you triumph over them is a picture of a Roman general, of a Roman king who's parading his, his foes as captives, who has stripped his enemies of their armor, yes, of their armor, who has conquered them and who is now parading them throughout the city as a message of victory. Now listen to this. When Paul sees this helpless Jesus we've just read about, when Paul sees this tortured Jesus, when Paul sees this somber, heavy dark scene we've been describing, he sees Jesus on a throne, not a cross. When Paul sees Jesus hanging on the cross, Paul connects the dots and he sees that there is something cosmic going on here. The principalities and powers are the powers of darkness. Now listen to this. The scene without this lens looks very much like the powers of darkness have just conquered Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is a victim suspended between heaven and earth. He looks very helpless, or does he? Well, Paul is saying here that the event of Calvary actually enabled Jesus to make the cross a throne. And in the cross, Jesus paraded the devil and his angels as the victor over the powers of hell. Now, 
he dragged them through the wheels of his chariot in front of the entire universe. Now how, now, how does this fit into the cosmic picture? Because this is about a controversy between good and evil. What's happening in Calvary is a response to a larger controversy. Yes? These powers of darkness, these principalities of darkness are part of this controversy. And the controversy began in Genesis chapter 3 where the accusation was presented, God is a liar. His warnings are meaningless. God does not have our best interest in mind. God is selfish. God is holding good things from us. You can dissect all of that from the dialogue that, that the serpent has with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Calvary is to be viewed in the backdrop of that. Listen to this. The story of sin began with a tree in a garden. Yes or no? Yes. We have a serpent dangling on a tree in a garden. And this whole thing began. And Jesus chases that scene. And now what do we have? We have Messiah coming from a garden, hanging on a tree to answer the problems that were introduced back in, on a tree in a garden. You see that? We went from a, from a tree in a garden to Jesus passing through the garden into the tree. We have these two pictures presented. Why? Because the Christian, the early church, they were reading Jesus on Calvary as a death blow, as a response to the controversy that was introduced back in Genesis. Listen to what I'm saying. Lucifer is recorded as saying in the great controversy, in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14, I will be, can you finish for me? I will be like the most high. Yes? This is a competition for who gets elected as the most high. This is the, the battle between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, between light and darkness, right? Lucifer, I will be like the most high. Who's the most high? I will be like God. Now check this out. At Calvary, Jesus called his bluff. Why? Satan, you want to be like the Most High? This is what the Most High is like. Do you want to be like the Most High? This is how low, how deep, and how far the Most High goes for sinners. This is, this is what it's like to be the Most High. Now, now listen, watch the scene. Jesus is on the cross. The two thieves have disappeared because the spotlight is on Jesus. Jesus is on the cross, and the devil, Satan, is right in front of him, and this is the dialogue taking place. This is what it's like to be the Most High. And then Jesus basically says, checkmate. What's your next move? Can you say hallelujah? It's necessary to go deep and icky and dark and somber and ugh and heavy. Because that's exactly what Jesus threw right back at the devil. That demonstrates the depth. You follow what I'm saying? The cross of Calvary is not a depiction of a helpless, powerless victim. The cross of Calvary is a throne. Why would the early church take an instrument of torture and execution and make it the symbol, the universal symbol of their religion? <sighs> because nothing else, would, nothing else would, would do, right? Because it is a symbol of how God took the very worst, the very darkest, the very lowest, and he transformed it into glorious throne. Amen. And I'm leaving you with this. The very triumphs of Jesus' foes, can you follow this? This is, the this is it. We're landing the plane here, okay? Hold on with me for this. The very triumphs of his foes, he used for their, what everybody? Defeat. Defeat. He compelled their dark achievements to subserve his ends, not theirs. They nailed him to the tree, not knowing that by that very act, they were bringing the whole world to his feet. They gave him a cross, not guessing that he would make it a throne. They flung him outside the gate to die. 
not knowing that in that very moment they were lifting up all the gates of the universe to let the king come in. They thought to root out his doctrines, not understanding that they were implanting imperishably in the hearts of men the very name they intended to destroy. They thought that they had God with his back to the wall, pinned and helpless and defeated. They did not know that it was God himself who had tracked them down. He did not conquer in spite of the dark mystery of evil. He conquered through it. And if Jesus could take a cross and make it a glorious throne, then hallelujah, he could take any cross that we are bearing and make that a throne. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the glorious the glorious news, Lord, the glorious report, this unbelievable report that a hideous, dark scene could become such a glorious, victorious shout of, 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 of God's conquering the powers of evil. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with this, with this hope and with this, that you would refresh our commitment to Jesus on the cross. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.